Hey guys, this will be video 24 for the Gibson Les Paul custom restoration. Um, I'll briefly cover uh, the delay since uh, video 23 up to this one. Uh, several things. My phone crashed about uh, two weeks back and it kind of crashed at a good time because I had, um, and I don't like to talk about, I don't like to sound like I'm complaining, but I basically dislocated my left middle finger uh, roughly around video 8, video 9, and I thought it was going to heal, but it progressively got worse and worse and worse. And long story short, uh, my left arm, typically the reason I keep the sleeve down is I broke my left arm completely in half about eight years ago. And it was horrific. I mean, it was a horrific situation. And I've always had to be real careful about uh, stressful work, working with routers and things like that. And even in the engine building, it was really difficult. But anyway, again, not to complain, I apologize for about the delay again, uh, from, you know, you know, six months from now, anyone looking at the video series, they won't realize there was a, a gap between 23 and 24. So, uh, it's, uh, my finger is, is about 90% back now. I feel much better, but it was to the point where I realized I had to let it rest a little bit. So on that note, got that behind me, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, what I'm going to be discussing in this video is, uh, Primarily, I'm going to hit on uh, binding and how to uh, uh, all the different things that, that relate to, to just binding. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the neck discussion in a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to talk about tuners. And this is kind of, is this the last call? Absolutely. Uh, last chance to make changes because I haven't, uh, I haven't drilled the headstock yet. And this is uh, far more important than even though I know and speaking to this client, even though I know we've already, we already have our tuners, let's make sure that these are the tuners we want to put on this guitar, because if they're not correct, then I may, we may make a horrific mistake. And then um, uh, what else will I be talking about? Um, I'll probably just go, I may go into detail about the uh, fretboard, let me see if it's in the camera. Uh, yeah, the fretboard's over on, on the far left. I've got the, all the mother of pearl in there, but I have not radiused it yet. All the fret slots are cut. And um, and I hope I remember, I'm going to write this down, 24.75-inch uh, scale uh, versus 24.56, uh, uh, I think it's 4 Five six three five six four. Um, let me go ahead and hit on the scale because I, I don't want to forget that uh, Gibson had a lot of different scales, and in the early fifties, and I, I'm going to keep this very short. In the early fifties, uh, their scale was primarily uh, twenty four and three quarter, and if I'm not mistaken, I guess in in fifty eight, uh, maybe fifty eight when they introduced the first Les Paul. I mean, it, when they introduced the burst, the, I think they changed the scale over to 54.56, uh, or basically, uh, I'm sorry, 24 and 9 sixteenths, uh, which is a very short scale. And my, the guitar that I built, the replica that I'm building, is, is that very, very short scale. And it's pretty cool. It feels good. I was expecting, based on, again, from online research, when I discussed the restoration of this guitar with this client, I was anticipating opening up the box and finding a neck that had uh, a 24 and uh, 9 sixteenths roughly or 5 eighths inch roughly scale. Well, it wasn't. It was 24 and 3 quarter, which is just, just enough, just long enough, just, you know, about what, just a quarter of an inch longer, but it made it far more difficult to do this renovation because that's not a fretboard that I could have purchased from Stuart McDonald. And I'm going to digress a little bit here because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, typically I always do my own fretboards, but I got to thinking, I thought, I know this body's going to be hell. It's going to be a really rough job. So worst case scenario, I may just order my ebony fretboard from Stuart McDonald 
pre-radius to 12 inch radius and uh, obviously they won't put the, the mother of pearl in there and they won't put the frets in there but I could have had a lot of machine work done from them even though it would have cost me more money I wouldn't have made any money off the neck it would have allowed me to you know rock it through the job and stay focused on on the other stuff uh, this job is not about making money and I, I think uh, Rick and I both agreed on the front end this is going to be an incredible tutorial situation and this this ain't about you know any any this really money is is by far in, in the back seat on this job um, so on that note as far as like you know making a killing off of it uh, or but then again I didn't you know I didn't uh, uh, you know no one's being ripped off here I think it's a good deal for everyone so I'm, I'm all over the map here a little bit. It started with that whole 24-inch scale thing. But, uh, and I sound like, I hope I don't sound like I'm complaining because I'm not complaining. I just, I just say this for the guys that are possibly doing this uh, from a standpoint of working on guitars and making money. Man, you got to be really careful because the online, you know what, crap that's out there will tell you one thing and the idiots on the forum will tell you one thing and man you open up the box and it ain't it ain't nothing about what's online so proceed with extreme extreme caution and even Stuart McDonald when, when you're going to do renovations or make promises or let's say for instance you're going to build a Les Paul neck and list it on eBay for sale and you guarantee oh yeah it'll fit a Les Paul from 70 six to 82 and then you and then you go online and it says it's a 24.9 you know um 24.564 scale but it's really a 24.75 whoa man you just sent a neck to them that these guys are going to glue it on a body and they're going to string it up and realize they're going to be moving their bridge a quarter of an inch to make this guitar playable and it's going to look ridiculous because then the bridge is going to be there's going to be a huge gap between the bridge pickup and the bridge. So, man, I digress uh, much more than I thought I would there, but uh, I guess it's good to get that behind us. Let me check the camera here and see where we are. We're at seven minutes, 30 seconds. I got a new camera as well. I mean, a new uh, cell phone as well. It looks like the picture's fairly nice. Um, I hope the audio is, is, is as good as the other or, or hopefully better. So, okay, long introduction there, and, and I, again, really digressed about the scale much more than I was expecting, but I guess it's good to kind of just check that off and get it behind us. Proceed with extreme caution, and uh, what is the 24.75 inch scale, 24 and 3 quarter inch scale? Um, and this is interesting. I just, I just had a revelation here. It may be that the, that the, that the, the Gibson Custom, the black, which was based on the original, this is the ripple in the pool of the original 1954. Well, guess what scale the, the 1954 Les Paul Custom had? 24.75. So if there's any of you guys out there that uh, have intimate knowledge, let me know. Uh, that would be really cool to know that maybe all the custom, the black Les Paul Customs received a different scale from maybe the everyday uh, burst Les Paul. That would be incredible uh, information to have. Regardless, we ended up with a with a custom built neck here, uh, a fretboard here that uh, is extremely time consuming. But uh, nonetheless, that that's uh, and I'll do some research on that as well. So anyway, binding uh, and I put in parentheses here. Uh, keep it light and positive. So if that tells you anything, the binding was an effing nightmare. That was that was a nightmare, but it, it's it's pretty much finished and it, it turned out really really good. I'm very happy with it. Um, demonstrate the router depth adjustment uh, fixture and then demonstrate shaping the binding uh, down and discuss uh, binding swelling uh, tools, chisels, files, razor blades, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm gonna throw that over to the side and uh, I'm gonna start out just by talking about the fixture here and I am. At nine minutes and 44 seconds, I know this camera is not going to cut off, so I'm going to make sure I end this by 30 minutes. Um, this is basically uh, how high can I go? 
Okay, so as long as I stay in here. All right, this is obviously your traditional trim. This It's more of a, a router for just doing edge trimming, but uh, I usually push them to the limit. And this is basically just a little a concept that I came up with a long time ago, but never really put into play. And all it, all it is is, is a Stuart McDonald. They have a little jig like this. And all this is is just uh, a piece of, of uh, acrylic that I cut out with a hole saw to give it some height. And then that is uh, that is this little, little fixture here, this little tool here that I showed in one of the early videos um, where if you're if you if you have a framing square, I'm not gonna start talking about square uh, stairs, I swear. But uh, you you put you can put this on your square, and let's say you can you're gonna have a rise. This is for rise over run, and you you put one on the one on the run, and then you put one on the rise, and then you can use that little thing. But I got to looking at it, I thought, oh my gosh, man, this is this is an incredible tool. I can use this for like scraping. You know, I can set the depth, and I can scrape with that. But what what I and then I also got to think, I thought. Well, wait a minute. I got this incredible ability to set adjustments, and even under high-speed uh, RPMs and vibration, brass is known to not turn loose. That's why it's used in the marine industry a lot. Once it once it locks, man, it locks. It really grips. So I got the thing, and I thought, hmm, I can use this as a as a as a depth depth adjustment tool. And then I put this little bearing on here. This is a half inch diameter bearing, and you can see it, it spins. I mean, it, it rolls freely. And then the acrylic that came out there had to be super thin, but it was a it was a real um, it was a real precise drill and cut because you had to make sure that the acrylic did not interfere with the outside diameter of the bearing. Now, this outside di diameter of this bearing is half inch. Well, so is this bit. And what this allowed me to do, I can set my um, I can set my router um, bit at insanely deep depth. Well, you know, roughly right at a quarter, and still not interfere with that bearing. I mean, it's literally missing it by probably two thousandths, maybe three thousandths. But as long as that's torqued and not moving, and what that allows me to do is by by just setting this. Let me see if I explain this. This is pretty important. This may sound, seem kind of boring to some of you guys, but if you're if you're truly wanting to do this and and do this do this often, and you never and you don't want to buy a hundred fifty dollars worth of of router bits and all different bearings uh, different bearings, uh, then you can literally just uh, you can see I, I torqued that down. and that was torqued by hand. That wasn't torqued with a tool, so. Let me see if I can pull this up. All right, the concept of this little tool is to allow a certain amount of the bit to be exposed. But then because it's the half inch width right here, as long as I stay perfectly in line, we're talking center lines, center line of the, the, the bit, center line of the bearing. And then I know that when I'm doing my routing, I'm always I'm always routing only. Let me just go ahead and tighten, tighten this back up because it's not important that it's left in place. Uh, when I'm doing my routing, and this works best on a flat surface, obviously, but when I'm doing my routing, I can get a pretty good grip on the tool like that right there, and I'm safe because my fingers back here. I'm not going to risk you know slipping slipping and falling into it. Not being dramatic there, but these are insanely dangerous. But then I always keep this portion up on the body, the body that whatever I'm routing will be the back of the body. If it's the, uh, if it's like a flat top guitar, obviously the front. I can't, you can't use this on the on the on an arch top; it just won't work. But then I'm making contact on the body here, so I'm not making very much contact. So I'm I'm a lot. It's almost you're almost freehand routing, but using the base is just kind of a a, a guide and assurance. And with this little tool, I know this sounds long-winded, but you're going to see later why it's so important to have the ability to just go, eh, I'm going to go a little bit deeper, or I'm going to go a little bit, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little bit deeper, or I'm going to soften it up a little bit. I'm only going to go, you know, maybe 
um, a half a millimeter deep. Why? Because this right here, we're, we're, this is just like machine work. These are 20 thousandths, 20, 40, 60, 80, uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120 thousandths right there. And then on, on top of that, you put the, the, the Duco cement in there, the binding cement, they're going to swell just a little bit. So you're literally, uh, you're, you're, out, you're out of the realm of jumping from 1 16th to uh, 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 3 30 seconds up to an eighth, et cetera, et cetera. So with this little tool right here, man, you can split the world. You, you can split it to hairs and you don't even have to measure it. You just grab up. Uh, I need, I need to misplace that little board. There's, oh, here it is. Uh, you just set the depth and, gra and grab your binding. And you say, okay, I, I know, I don't care. I, don't, I could care less how thick that is. I just want to make sure it works. You know, and then uh, I know it's a sixteenth of an inch if you're using the bit because I've used it before. No, that's a different. That, that's a nine thousandths. Uh, this one is a sixteenth of an inch. This is an eighty thousandths. So you can see. All right, where are we? We're we're already at fifteen minutes. Uh, man, I'm so long winded. Uh, but long story short, you can see right there. I never measured that. I just get. I just kind of eyeballed it. Hit it the first shot. So cool. Um, and you can make some tick marks on here if you wanted on your little tool, if you want to get really, really crazy about it. But but even hit the depth, the first shot. So, or you see, what did I do with my binding? You could come in here and, and possibly use that same, that same route depth to route, uh, you know, four of these, or maybe three of these. Now, now I know this may seem kind of like long-winded and just not stopping, but you see how important it is to, to be able to have a little jig like that? I mean, what it cost me, you can buy these at, at your big box stores. I bought these at Home Depot for like $7 for a pair, you know, and you got two of them. So go buy a couple of these. And it's amazing. They're still on the shelf. I was, I've had those probably for 20 years, but uh, they're still on the shelf because I saw them not too long ago. Anyway, yeah, a little bit long-winded there, but I think that makes sense. Uh, binding, because the binding is always going to be a different uh, uh, thicknesses. And if you really want to get into this and do beautiful binding, uh, you better know how to uh, anticipate binding swell, as well as how to keep binding swell under control, and how to when to know when not to do uh, multi multi-piece binding because uh, it's extremely hard. It's extremely hard. And I, I had problems with this. I had, to, I had to cut some of it out and start over. I'm not gonna start talking about that because I don't wanna sound like I'm complaining. Okay, and this is the, the, the binding cement, bind all. I got that from Stuart McDonald. I think that's about 20 bucks. Stuff is not cheap. So what else should I talk about about just binding itself? Um, this is this is nine, 90 thousandths. This is stuff is enormous. Okay, basically what this is, this is the Les Paul top. Uh, white, black, white, black, white, black, and then the 90 thousandths outside. That's a Les Paul custom. So 20 thousandths times, what, six? And then one ninety thousandths. And anyway, that this stuff right here is like working with steel. It's so stiff. And what I do is I, I go ahead and buy them wide and I cut it in half or I cut it at 60% and I use the, because this had a different thickness on the top as it did on the bottom. And then it's weird. It gets painted over. I'll explain that later, but it, it it's not a traditional guitar. You, you just route down that depth, but on this guitar, it, it, it routed down like a 16th of an inch wider, and then they allowed the black paint to come over it and create a faux body thickness. Anyway, you know, so just proceed with caution and stuff like that. That's that's where that came in play, where I just went ahead and bought the wide stuff and cut it down and used it to my own, own liking. Uh, all right, so let me get this off the table. So I stopped talking about it. And it's out of sight, out of mind. I get the binding cement. I will leave that up there because I want to talk about that briefly. 
And what I'll do is talk about it very briefly. Trans tan, I've already brought this up. Uh, you can mix this with denatured alcohol or you can mix this with water. Uh, you could mix it with denatured alcohol and then blend it into your, uh, or, or you could just do one or two drops into straight into your lacquer, just like I tinted the lacquer black. Uh, be careful because you'll end up, the first couple of coats will be beautiful. And then one or two more coats after that, five or six more coats after that, you, you're panicking because it's, it's turning a brown on you. It, it's very potent. So this is the color. This, this is the trans tint. This is honey amber mixed in water, about three drops to a quarter of a cup of water. And it still gave a good lemon base uh, for like a, a, a typical arch top uh, lemon base. All right, let me stop talking about that. Uh, I will talk about this just, just a very small amount longer. This is typically, you know, your body thickness. Let me check the camera. We're at 21 minutes. Uh, this is your typical body thickness right here. So you can see how, I'm glad I thought of this because I, I was kind of just expecting you guys to read my mind a little while ago. Is your routing, well, you would be routing this way. That that bearing is riding right in here. So you can see how you could come in. I mean, you could do an, you could do an SG. You know, they're thicker than that. They're probably, I think SG is like one and three eighths. You, so you could do an SG basically, or at least one side with that. So, okay, let's stop talking about that. In other words, build your tool or just go on Stuart McDonald. I think they sell them for like 50 bucks. It's probably cheaper and easier to just build the thing. All right, what else do I need to talk about? Uh, I need to get this off the table, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, very quickly, uh, I bought these uh, router bits set from uh, um, Woodcraft. This is a white side. Uh, that is the route depth on the Les Paul, the upper channel, the all the black, white, black, white, black, white, 90 thousandths white, extremely deep route. So I used that bit on the initial route and then came in and did a different bit to route the other one. All right, what do we got? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this very briefly. I, I won't go into too much detail. I built this little jig. You can get these at Stuart McDonald as well. Uh, I think it's like a little tower that's, that will, will go. You can adjust the height and turns your router into an overhead router. Cool thing about theirs, I think it, it, it actually uh, rides up and down. So if you've got a body, a, a, a guitar on a, on a, on a, uh, uh, a pattern then and, and as you're turning that pattern th this will raise up a little bit this one's not mine's fixed so you could build something like this for nothing and then you could mount that router I just held it in my hand right there and then you just clamp this to your table so I got these little little fruit flies in here so I'm trying to make a presentation so again build uh, Build your tools as you need them, and that's what I use to uh, just make sure I'm in the camera. And I got it set kind of high. It's 23. We're at like 23 minutes. I might go about 35 minutes on this video since the camera probably is not going to cut off. But with that little tower there, you know, I was able to uh, set this up on my uh, just like on a table saw because I trust my table saw deck to be 100%. And this is clamped like to the edge of the table, the router's overhead. And then I'm able to do, uh, let's see, the, the bit is turning this way. Uh, well, I don't have a bit. Yeah, I gotta get a bit to help us see this. You know, if, you know, if this is the bit, because the bit would go through that little hole right there, the bit is turning clockwise. So since the bit is turning this direction, and this is very important, do not do a climbing cut when you're trying to, to do, to when you're trying to route a body. If you start taking the body into, make sure that's in the camera. If you start taking the body into that and it's doing a climbing cut, it'll grab, especially on this corner right here. I don't know what it is. I think it has something to do with the grain. That SOB will grab that right there and it will tear the 
you know what, out of the side of the body. I, I nearly destroyed my penguin when I was building it. I was doing a because I'm bad about doing climbing cuts. They cut very clean. Well, well, when it was going around that corner and it caught, man, it it pulled the guitar in, and and I was trying to do too much at once. And when it did, man, it, it grabbed hold of me and just tore the devil out of it. And uh, but it was going to be paint grade anyway. But what I'm saying, you'll be turning uh, clockwise, so always route your body like this right here and let's say like, how's how would i start this i would probably go i would probably start right here and i'm watching it and i would route. and the reason i'm having to do this just by mock-up my camera crashed right after i I, I demonstrated this on my 59 replica and i shot like a 30 minute video of me routing the, ch the binding channel on that guitar body only to have the thing crash and i lost that video so it's, I nearly came out of my boots. I was so angry because it was too late after that. But anyway, you would go in like this and you would, you would cut like this and then you follow it and then you, you know, go around like this and then you just keep going, keep going. And you can do small passes. Uh, you might do step binding and stuff like that or step pass, step, step routing in order to create different channels. So. All right, uh, binding, demonstrate outer depth adjustment, demonstrate uh, shape and binding. I'm going to give you this briefly, uh, uh, very, very briefly. And I, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about how well the binding turned out. The, the binding actually turned out extremely well. I mean, it's beautiful. Let me see if that's in the camera. I'll just kind of slow down, let you guys take a look at it. Beautiful. Turned out very nice. I hope that's filming okay. I'll try to go slow and I'll turn, I'll rotate the guitar a little bit. And there's the old, there's the cheerleader. Kept us in the game. Got to keep her. Look at this, this is so cool right here. Look how sweet that is. Got to keep just that little bit of vintage, but, and not, not replace it, not tear it out. Why? Because it's original. Didn't want to lose that. This is still dirty up here. Let me stop on this right here. This was a this was a very that was very difficult. It turned out extremely well, but because of that real tight radius right there, that was uh, a real, very detailed process. And I'm going to briefly talk about this. Uh, this body is in in horrific condition. I'm not making fun of it. I'm not complaining. But what I've learned from doing this restoration. This is this was one of the most, the most difficult binding jobs I've ever done because there's so much tear out in the wood that any of the duco cement that you put in would would come out and and fill in these bad areas and I'm sitting here trying to maintain the historical aspects of this guitar body uh it in hindsight I learned my lesson that Man, it's it's almost impossible to pull this off. So uh, again, I'm not complaining, but I, I learned a valuable lesson that uh, it, it was very very difficult to pull off. Um, it, it still, nonetheless, it blended very well, um, like that right there. Okay, I hope that shows up. See that right, that that cavern cavern. Okay, we're at 28 minutes already. Is that kind of cavern right there? And you can see it. There's a little bit of a cement. I had to come in here and kind of dig that, you know what, out and just kind of expose that mahogany because I'm not going to come in here and start filling this with putty. I, I, that, that was never our intention. We wanted to maintain this road-worn, uh, this you know, look and not take it back. Uh, I did have to... Uh, I'll hit this very briefly. The Duco cement, uh, the glue started attacking the paint, and this I've had to do. Uh, I had to redo the top paintwork, uh, so every bit of that is new, and it forced me even up here. I had to come in and I had to paint up here. I didn't have to paint anything up here. Why? Because it was all original. But down here, I had to I had to redo every bit of this and then blend it into the original. But I think, and I have not got a chance to talk to Rick because I had problems with my phone, but I went ahead and buffed out those lines. Um, if that's a problem, I'll take a razor knife and cut them back in. Not being a smart ass, but just saying that, you know, that's, if you, if you want to see that stuff, that would make no sense to me 
or to any luthier or to any anybody that owns a guitar because right now I can't find our repair period I can't find it and I, I'll shoot extremely straight as I have with you guys all throughout this whole process I never expected that and and that's that is more testament to the T88 epoxy uh, mix on a molecular level let it kick mix it some more then put your black resin in and look what we got we got a guitar that uh, I, I honestly don't think anyone uh, would ever be able to to determine where we uh, repaired the job or not other than this video series would, would they would, I don't think they would believe it unless they saw the video series of where we where we started and where we have uh, ended up so what else should I talk about uh, as far as the binding I don't think there's anything to talk about other than what are the tools that I use. I'm gonna hit this very quickly. When it come, when it came down to really uh, the the first tool I would use when I hit the binding would be this little uh, Woodcraft rasp. I can take that rasp, use this finger as a guide against the the body. I apologize if I was in the camera. I, one of my videos I got I got right in the camera got loud as hell, so I apologize for that. Uh, but you would come in, and I can do it on this one because I'm getting ready to do some shaping. I'd take my finger, and and this is where you've got to really keep your radio off. Because look at our look at our our height right there. I got to make really certain that I don't get too thin. And I may only do just a very brief amount of this. But basically, you could use this. This is a, called a rasp, and yeah, I can even scoot out here on the end. Make sure that's in the video. And I can scoot out here on the end and just really control my cut and make a cut and then stop and then ask myself, okay, where, where can I go? How far? So that right there, I need to stop. But this back here is a little bit high, a little bit thick. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm being, this is dangerous doing this on video because I'll get distracted and I'll end up making a mistake. So you can come in, and even though that's original. I gotta blend into it, so I gotta I gotta knock off some of the uh, I gotta knock off some of the, uh, the the vintage amber to get that. I'm gonna stop on that, but basically you go from the rasp to a small cross cut file, and then to uh, straight cuts with a, a machinist file where you're just coming across, and you're able to keep your fingers in here and set the depth like kind of like the, the little jig we built for our router. And then this is very uh, a very time-consuming thing. I think it took me something like uh, two days, two and a half days to do all this binding. Uh, and then so you're coming in with uh, tools, rasp, I mean uh, rasp, files, and then uh, and get this off. Then you're going to be coming in with the exacto knife, and and you're just and I'm not going to do that. I was going to do this. And, and you want to make like one, let me see if that was in the camera, yeah. Don't go, don't sit here and do this. You'll you'll carve little um, ridges, and then as you start coming across it, then you'll catch in those ridges. Always have a, have a plan of, of kind of like, you know, taking it all the way around. See how I'm using my finger? It's no special tool here. Um, and look how much you're taking off. I mean, you're really... You're really knocking off some material. And on that note, if you're sitting there listening to your favorite song, man, you'll 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 hit that thing uh two times too many, and then you'll hold it up and go, Oh my god, what did I just do? I just lost my binding. So it, it cuts very quickly. And and the only thing worse than that, or I should say better, is my surgical chisel. When your binding is like 90 thousandths, it, it was actually hanging over the body. I put my thumb, I hope that shows up in the camera. I put my thumb right there and I revealed, I'm only gonna do this once because I don't want to risk making a mistake. Let's see how I can start, take, I can start taking off uh, thickness. And uh, I'll do it, go ahead and do it here. And this, this ought to be pretty easy to show on the camera. See that black overspray? Hopefully this will show up. My, my, I'm using my uh, middle finger as the, as the depth gauge. 
and I'm uh, I'm not being very gentle here. I'm actually uh, I'm controlling the tool, and I'm actually I'm making it I'm making it work. And these are kind of step cuts. I hope that's showing okay. This is this is this is something I prefer to do hovering over it and a lot of times I'll actually have my magnifying glass out and I'll just be looking at this in the mag under the magnifier. So on that note, I'm going to stop. I don't want to risk I don't want to risk getting this too thin because this binding is a is a 80 thousandths on the back whereas it was 90 thousandths on the front. And if you saw I just dropped my surgical chisel uh, I, hadn't, I haven't mentioned, I have carpet in my shop under all of my desks so that if I drop that chisel or anything, a knife, or if I drop the guitar, it's going to hit carpet. So, okay, let's stop talking about binding. Uh, extremely long winded there, but all right, we're at 35 minutes. Uh, I think I'm going to end this video just because of that's a good break point. And then the next video, I'll go into discussing the neck because I don't want this to turn into an hour-long video. So I appreciate your patience, and sorry about the delay from video 23 to 24, but I think we're back in the saddle. So I'm going to end the video there.